In this video, we're going to take a detailed look at the inner workings of a bipolar junction transistor, or BJT. We'll explore how charge carriers like electrons and holes move through the device, what each of the currents represents, and how this all comes together to achieve the transistor's primary function, amplification. We will break down every concept from the ground up, making it easy for beginners to follow along. Let's start by examining the diagram. What we see here is a cross-section of an NPN bipolar junction transistor connected to an external circuit. A transistor has three main regions, each with a terminal for connection. On the left, we have the emitter, labeled with an E. In the middle, we have the base, labeled with AB. And on the right, we have the collector, labeled with AC. These regions are made of semiconductor material, which has been doped to create specific electrical properties. The emitter is labeled N double plus, the base is P plus, and the collector is N. Let's quickly review what this means. N stands for N-type material, where the majority of charge carriers are free electrons. P stands for P-type material, where the majority of charge carriers are holes, which are essentially the absence of an electron and behave like positive charges. The plus signs indicate the level of doping. N double plus means the emitter is very, very heavily doped with impurities that create an abundance of free electrons. P plus means the base is also heavily doped, but with impurities that create a high concentration of holes. Finally, the N collector is lightly doped, meaning it has fewer free electrons compared to the emitter. Another critical design feature, which is key to the transistor's operation, is that the base region is physically very, very thin. Now, let's look at how this transistor is connected in a circuit. This specific configuration is called the active mode, which is the mode used for amplification. To achieve this, we use two voltage sources. The first source, labeled V sub B, is connected between the base and the emitter. Notice the polarity. The positive terminal is connected to the P-type base, and the negative terminal is connected to the N-type emitter. This is called forward biasing the base emitter junction. A forward bias lowers the natural energy barrier at the junction, making it much easier for current to flow across it. The second voltage source, labeled V sub CB, is connected between the collector and the base. Here, the polarity is reversed, the positive terminal is connected to the N-type collector, and the negative terminal is connected to the P-type base. This is called reverse biasing the collector base junction. A reverse bias increases the energy barrier and creates a wide depletion region with a strong electric field across it. With the circuit biased in this way, let's trace the flow of charge. The action starts at the forward biased base emitter junction. Because the energy barrier is lowered, charge carriers begin to diffuse across the junction. Since the emitter is an N double plus region, packed with electrons, and the base is a P plus region, filled with holes, two things happen simultaneously. First, and most importantly, a massive number of electrons are injected from the heavily doped emitter into the base. This flow of electrons is represented by the current I sub En. Second, a much smaller number of holes are injected from the base into the emitter. This flow of holes is represented by the current I sub EP. The total current flowing out of the emitter terminal, which we call I sub E, is the sum of these two components. So, I sub E equals I sub E N plus I sub E P. Because the emitter's doping is so much heavier than the bases, the electron current I sub E N is significantly larger than the whole current I sub E P. This is a deliberate design choice to make the transistor efficient. Now, let's follow the huge number of electrons that have just been injected into the thin, p-type base. These electrons are now minority carriers in a region filled with majority carrier holes. They have two possible fates. The first, and by far the most common fate, is that they travel straight across the very thin base region without running into a hole. Because the base is so narrow, most electrons can diffuse across it very quickly. The second, less common fate, is that an electron might encounter a hole and recombine. 
When this happens, the free electron fills the hole, and both charge carriers are eliminated. This event is labeled recombination in our diagram. As the electrons that successfully cross the base approach the collector base junction, they encounter the strong electric field we created with the reverse bias voltage V sub CB. This electric field acts like a powerful vacuum cleaner, immediately grabbing any nearby electrons and sweeping them across the junction and into the collector region. This strong flow of electrons, which originated in the emitter, traveled across the base, and were collected by the collector, constitutes the collector current, labeled I sub C. As you can see from the large gray arrow, this is the main path for the current. So, what about the base current, I sub B? The diagram shows that this small current is actually made of two separate components, which we'll call I sub B1 and I sub B2. Let's look at I sub B1 first. This current is directly related to the holes that were injected from the base back into the emitter. For every hole that leaves the base and enters the emitter, a new hole must be supplied to the base from the external circuit to replace it. This flow of replacement holes into the base terminal is the current I sub B1. So, I sub B1 is equal in magnitude to the whole current I sub EP. Now let's look at I sub B2. This current is caused by the recombination that happens inside the base. Remember when some of the electrons from the emitter recombined with holes in the base? When a hole is lost to recombination, it must also be replaced from the external circuit to maintain the electrical balance of the base region. The current that supplies these replacement holes for recombination is I sub B2. Therefore, the total base current, I sub B, which flows into the base terminal, is the sum of these two small currents, I sub B1 plus I sub B2. It's the current needed to supply holes for injection into the emitter and to replace holes lost to recombination. Let's put it all together. A large emitter current, I sub E, flows into the device. This current is composed almost entirely of electrons. The vast majority of these electrons travel across the base and are collected, forming the large collector current, I sub C. A very small fraction of the total current is diverted to the base terminal as I sub B. This base current accounts for the small number of holes injected into the emitter and the small number of electrons that recombine in the base. According to Kirchhoff's current law, the total current entering the transistor must equal the total current leaving it. This gives us the fundamental equation for a BJT, the emitter current, I sub E, is equal to the base current, I sub B plus the collector current, I sub C. The magic of the transistor lies in the ratio of these currents. Because the base is so thin and the emitter is so heavily doped, the base current I sub B is very, very small compared to the collector current I sub C. This means that a tiny change in the small base current can cause a huge change in the large collector current. This is the principle of current amplification, which makes the BJT one of the most important inventions in modern electronics. In summary, we've seen that by carefully controlling the doping levels, the physical dimensions, and the applied voltages, we can make a device where a small input current at the base controls a much larger output current at the collector. This is the fundamental principle of the bipolar junction transistor operating in its active mode.